Good morning. Well, I'm here because we have another baby dedication. So if the Holdman family would come up, Kyle and Stephanie, bring your family up, grandparents, aunts, uncles, whomever you brought with you, come on up. We're going to be dedicating Jaden Douglas Holdman today. Little Jaden. Jaden. Little Jaden man. Yeah, you can see yourself up there. That's pretty cool, huh? All right, Kyle and Stephanie, we're going to have y'all come over here. Yeah. That's a lot of Yeah, you're right there. You're good. Right there. Right there. Good. Okay, step to your left just a little. There you go. Yeah, we want Jaden right in the middle. Can you wave to everybody? Can you say hi? <laughs> well, yeah, I've got a scripture for Jaden and for his parents out of Ephesians 2.10. It says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. He is chosen, not just by you guys, but by God. He has a life of adventure ahead of him, along with good works for which he was created. His identity as a holdman will only be surpassed by his identity as a child of God. God has prepared a great future for him and will be with him every step of the way as he comes to realize his godly purpose on this earth. Yeah, I think everyone's wise. Shouldn't you explain how you kind of got this kid? Yeah, yeah. yeah. FedEx works wonders. <laughs> I'm turning it off. <laughs> um, no, Stephanie and I, uh, we started, uh, <laughs> we uh, got into this adoption process back in 2017, was it? Um, we've had it in our hearts to adopt since we were teenagers. Uh, that's something that we actually have been talking about since we were dating. Uh, but in 2017, we figured if we don't do it now, we'll have to do it when we're older and who wants to do that? So, <laughs> um, so we started the process. We were told, we went to the state. We were told there was absolutely 0% chance we were going to get a baby, which at the time I was okay with because no diapers, no potty train, you know, but okay. And so um, we, you know, we had it set that we were going to get a little girl between the ages of 5 and 12 um, that, you know, we kept going to these little meet and greets with all the kids, and of course, you feel terrible for all of them. You want to take all of them home, but we just, you know, never found the child. So we weren't getting anywhere at the state. We decided, I, I'm Cherokee and Ponca, so we decided to go through the Cherokees also. So um, while we're at our training through the Cherokees, because you have to be certified through the state and them, we were doing this class, and we get a call, I believe it was at lunch that there's this baby, little baby boy, that's six and a half months old, would we be interested in him? And, you know, I'm like, what? what? First off, it's not, a, you know, a child between five and 12, and then second off, it's not a girl. And we already have two boys, but okay, I'll hear you out. Um, well, uh, you know, God has funny ways of sometimes telling you things. And so as we find out more about this child, we realize that, I'm the only one in the state that's qualified to adopt him because he's Ponca Indian. Um, the way that they find out is, I'm from Ponca City, so it's a small community. Everybody knows everybody, you know, so you know everybody's business. Um, so his caseworker actually knows my mom and seen her tag on her license plate on the back of her vehicle and put two and two together. And that's how we were found as the match. So I'm sitting here, you know, looking for all these signs, Stephanie and I, and then, you know, they say that, and I'm like, all right, God just hit me in the face with a brick. There's your sign. And, you know, so um, we got him whenever he was six and a half months old, April 13th of last year. He is uh, 18 months. We finalized our adoption in November. And, uh, I mean, he's, he was born eight weeks premature, so he's a little guy. But, uh, you know, he had a rough background with his bio parents. Um, born with some stuff in his system, but praise God, there's no defects. He's completely, you know, healthy. Um, he's vertically challenged like myself, so he'll fit right in. <laughs> yeah. 
We, we need built-in stools around my house to reach the second shelf of the cabinets, all right? So, <laughs> but uh, that's why I have tall friends and family. <laughs> like, we get to China out, but anyway. Uh, I'm just so blessed that, you know, we're a part of this church, that you guys could all be here to help us with this. We've been with the church since day one, and so I'm super stoked about our uh, 10-year anniversary coming up. That's awesome. Praise God on that one. And uh, I'm just, I'm really happy and fortunate and blessed that my kids get to grow up in this church as well. So thank you guys. Praise the Lord. I know you were thinking it, so we thought, you know, it's important that... See a bunch of blonde head kids and this little guy. <laughs> Looks awesome. He's gonna forever know this that he was chosen. Amen. That's gonna be the coolest thing that he was chosen. It, all things worked because he was chosen for you and you for them. So, Father, we just thank you in Jesus' name. We lay our hands on this child and we thank you for this family and a great support system of life and future, God. We thank you his steps are going to be ordered, God, in the name of Jesus. This is not by coincidence. It's by divine design. And you'll forever know what it feels like to be chosen and set apart because that's what you've done to each one of us. So I thank you, Lord God. You impart to him this, this concept of sonship that forever guide his way. And we thank you, Lord God, and commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Love you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Like the Bible's <laughs> okay. Okay. Awesome. Good stuff. Today I'm, I'm finishing up our We Are the Bridge. Today's our last installment, number 12 here. And I'm talking about the Church of the Gray, the last day's church, and how we're not going to be the Church of the Gray. The Church of the Gray is like we know what the Spirit is and we know what the flesh. We don't, wanna, we don't really follow the Spirit. We don't really follow the flesh. We just stay in the gray. Just kind of like, you know, we're, we're going to have a, a form of God, but we don't get crazy. We don't want to be sinners, sinners, but we're not really going to dump that either. We're just kind of like in the gray. It's kind of in the gray. And I'm taking my text out of 2 Timothy 3, 5. It says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Having a form, this, this word having translates to holding on. Holding on to a form, a formation, uh, or, or better, a development of structure. I'm holding on to a structure of God, but not God. I'm holding on to a, to a, to a seemingly close thing that looks like God, but it's not God. See, God has a heart for you. It's not a rules and regulations thing. It was always designed from heart to heart, face to face relationship from the beginning of time to have fellowship with you. And we settle for rules and regulations and process. And God's going, man, I'm so deeper than that. I just want to love you from heart to heart. I know you. Like a song said, he knows your name. So it's holding on to this form gets easier to see and, and handle, having a form, a structure of godliness. And it says this translates to reverence, a sense of piety. Like we know how to play the game. And what we do with our Christianity is we say, okay, I'm going to serve God because I don't want to go to hell. And so I'm going to come in on Sunday, check the box, and then I'm going to do my own thing. It was never meant to be check the box and do your own thing. It was meant to be every breath, every step ordered, every breath divine, and there's joy unspeakable and full of glory. It really is much greater than you can imagine. So this sense of God, but denying, the word denying in the Greek translates to refuse, not just I don't want it, I refuse. So I'm, I'm, I feel comfortable with what I get my hands on. I feel comfortable with this form. It, it's, it's quantifiable. I, I don't do this, I don't do that, and if I stay this, then I'm good. If I don't, then God's mad at me. So this, this makes sense to me because it's kind of, out of the, how the world works this way, where if I do good, I get good, so it must be the same way, and it's not remotely the same. It's absolutely counterculture. In Christ, you lose your life. The world says, hold on to it. God says, lose it all, and you have everything. When you lose all your life, you get all of Jesus. The Bible says you're complete, lacking nothing. The Bible speaks about that we have everything that pertains to life and godliness, and if I'm lacking anything, then maybe, maybe the enemy's lying to me because that's his word, that I'm complete, lacking nothing, and I live my life not from a, a God that tolerates me, but that absolutely celebrates me. 
That's how we live. So I'm in this form this, this of, of piety or reverence, but then I'm refusing the power, the force, or, or the miraculous power, the same word that's found in Acts 1.8 where it says, you shall receive power to be my witnesses. What's the power of God for? And the, the word witness in the Greek translates to martus or martyr. You have the power to lay down your life and live for Jesus. That's the power you have. And then signs and wonders and everything else that God wants to do through you is available to you because you have the power to lay down your life and the power to receive his. You have the power to die to the old. That's awesome. And it becomes mir miraculous working power in your life. Everywhere you go, there's a word to be spoken. There's a life to change. And you just by being present carry the presence of God. This is powerful. This is a different way of living. But this particular group has said, no, 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 we, 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 don't, we, we refuse that because this is easier to handle and, and we just don't want that. But how did they get there? And by the way, this is the church in the last days, the church of the gray. They got there from verse 1 and 4 when they were all wrapped up with themselves in various ways. And I'm not going to go through all those verses, because, but let me just tell you, verse 1 through 4 is what they were at, it's what they were at spiritually, all caught up with themselves, living for God, but caught up with themselves. No greater victory for the enemy than a born-again, spirit-filled believer settling for gray. Oh, oh he, he doesn't mind you getting saved. If I got to lose one or two to get saved, well, let them get saved, but don't let them know what power they have or what authority they walk in. Let them struggle all their life with stuff that that they've overcome, but they don't know they've overcome. Let them struggle with identities that they have, but they don't know they have. That's easier. Leave it, living in the gray is much easier, and it distorts the truth of God for someone else as they see your life. It's more powerful for the enemy camp, enemy's camp to have someone living in the gray because it distorts the freedom that's found in Christ. This is the church of the gray. And so they've, they, they've got caught up with themselves. It's all basically one, verses one through four talks about, I'm all about me. And I've just left out the presence of God. Process is more important than presence. So this is point number one. Living in the gray is settling for process instead of presence. I want you to look at that real carefully. In every area of your life, there is a presence decision. There is a presence from the very presence of God's word to be spoken. In every situation you face, you walk with him, you talk with him. We talked about it tonight, today, we, the whole song. We're walking with him. You have the Holy Spirit within you that's guiding you into all truth and giving you the words to say when you don't know what to say. This is an everyday his presence in your life, not just on Sunday morning. Every breath filled with this power of the Holy Spirit to speak and bring forth life. That is your legacy. That is who you are. Come on, church. That's the truth. But it's easy. The church of the gray, the church of the last days. By the way, he's talking about the church of the last days. There's a possibility for the church of the last days to be a church of the gray and settle for mediocrity. Settle for lukewarm because they're all caught up with themselves. They've forgotten who they belong to and who has them at the center of their life. God, you are the heartbeat of God. The very, very power of resurrection is within you. You don't live just getting by. And I'm not talking about finances. I'm talking about spiritually. You are an authority. You are a force to be reckoned with. That's who you are. The church of the gray settles for process and not presence. That will not be us. That will not be we are the bridge. So, uh, and keep going on to the next point. My next point is about a, a kind of like a, a misunderstanding of power and, and performance. There's something that we get into our minds when we accept Jesus or even how religion works. Religion says if you perform good enough, then you'll, you know, matter of fact, if you ask anybody how to get saved, they'll say, well, if, I, if my good stuff outweighs my bad stuff, then I'll be okay. That, that leans to performance. And where did we learn about performance relationship? But to the world. If you study hard and you work hard, you get an A. If you don't, you get a B or a C. Or D. You, you've been trained all your life to work hard and get that little star. How many of you guys were star people in first grade? You got it. Oh, I knew it. I was, see, I, I, I was the opposite. You want to put a star? I'm not going to do it. 
Amen. Yeah. So, so here's the idea. Yeah, we are all striving and we learn and we learn very quickly. If I do things well, then I get promoted. And in Christ, it's actually the opposite. You die and you get promoted. At your worst, you get found. Church, that is awesome about God. And then, and then this is the amazing thing. He sees you complete. And I can sit and argue. Let me tell you, let me argue with you because I'm really, I I know me. And God said, no, I see you complete. Don't argue. Just say, yes, Lord. (laughs) We'll take that. It may take me a lifetime to figure that out, but I'm going to start with, okay, I agree with you. That's a good place to start. So we have these people in verse 21 of chapter 7 of Matthew. They said, didn't we do all these things? And that's what happens in our life. And this is amazing that you can do things in the name of Jesus. You have a sense and awareness of some kind of religious thing and never know him. And it's very precise. See, when we read that, I never knew you part in verse 21, we think it means, well, they started out good, they messed up, and God said, I don't, you messed up. No, it, it actually implies never from the beginning of time did I know who you were, which tells you someone can use the name of Jesus, can have information, maybe a doctorate degree in theology, and not know Jesus. There are people teaching theology courses out of a science. It's a great science. Or Bible studies because it's great history. But do they know Jesus? That's a great question. And what's amazing is that we have a group of people who've said, hey, didn't we perform well for you? And didn't we perform great works like prophecy and healing and casting out demons? Didn't we do some really, we did some pretty cool things. God, come on. We performed well. Church of the Grave focuses on performance. Church of the gray stays right there if I perform. And this is what it does. The weird thing is you approach God with, if I do everything you want me to, God, then you'll love me. And that means that you owe me. And you get into a relationship with the Father based on his performance. And then you judge him by his lack of performance. Well, you didn't come through, so I'm out. It was never meant to be performance on you or performance on him. Matter of fact, in Romans Romans 5 says, we have peace with God. Verse 1, we have peace with God because of Jesus Christ. And we go, man, thank God, I'm in. And we're going to see his glory. Whoo, man, it's awesome. Then verse 3 says, when you have trials, and you go, whoa, 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 whoa. (laughs) Trials, wait a minute, whoa. We have peace with God, and we're going to see his glory, and that's all initiated by God. We have peace with God because of Jesus, because of what God did in Jesus. So God initiated the peace, and then God's going to see his glory. So God initiates that you're going to have right standing and see his glory, and then all of a sudden he brings up trials. And I read this one time. I said, Holy Spirit, this is kind of weird. God, I don't, I, I'm not too hit by the trial thing. And so he said, go back and read it again. So I read it again, and the Lord said to me, okay, in verse 1 and 2, I have removed performance from you. In verse 3, will you remove performance from me? right, church? Here's the deal. I don't serve God because he, because he grants every prayer I have or somehow he's a Santa Claus or something. I serve God because he's Lord of lords. And he's Lord of my life. And because he is Lord of my life and because I know who I be, a son of God, the doing is an expression of knowing who I am. And signs and wonders follow. I'm not pursuing them. I'm connected to him. I'm sold out. And we live that way. So when you get to this place of, well, didn't we do all these things? Let me look at that verse here. And and it says, not everyone who calls, calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do. And this idea of do means to make or to abide in. A person who actually makes his makes his priority the presence of God and abides in. Those are people who are doing something. What are they doing? They're making God their number one in everything to abide in him, the will. So look at it again. Only those who actually do abide to make this their abode there, the will of God. The word will translates in the Greek to determination. Whatever God determines for my life, that's what I do. Not what's comfortable, not what's easy. I do whatever is determined by God for me to do. I listen, I embrace him, and I walk out my life. And if it hair lifts the Pope, too bad. This is what I got to do. 
If everyone around me gets mad, now, you know what? This is what I believe God has said. That's how this church got started 10 years ago. Lord, I'm ready to, okay, Lord, you're calling me to be a senior pastor. Okay, here we go. I'll go anywhere you want me to go. Matter of fact, I had this, when the Lord, I was in Houston, and God said, I want you to work on being a senior pastor, a uh, lead pastor. Okay, let me get used to that. So, okay, Lord, I'm ready to go. So I went on to uh, pastorsjobs.com. <laughs> I thought, okay, Lord, I'll go anywhere. I'll go anywhere you want me to go, God. I'll go anywhere. So I'm looking there, look at all this. And then I hear the Holy Spirit said, I want you to go back to Tulsa. No, -uh, I'm not going back to Tulsa. And the humor of God, okay, Bixby. I went, okay, Bixby works. <laughs> He said, you used to live around the corner. We used to live around the corner. Kim and I would run the corner over here. He said, I want you to redeem the area you lived in, 121st and Memorial. God is so funny. Seeking him, embraced by him, and walking out the determinations of the Lord. That's knowing him. Only those who hear from my Father will enter the heaven. Verse 22, and on judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name, and we cast out demons in your name, and we performed. We, and this word performed actually is the same word, to make your abode. I, I, I made my, my, my life, I made my life and my abode in performance. I lived in performance is what it's saying. Uh, many miracles in your name, and, but I will reply, I never knew you. I never knew you. Is it possible to get caught up with performance and never know the Lord? Yes. How do we stop that from happening? Know him. I mean, call upon his name. All that called upon the name of the Lord were saved. Not that complicated. So, but, but let me show you the church of the gray. The church of the gray, and number two, living in the gray places a priority on your will, my performance, what I want to do, which leads to, pursuit, which leads to a pursuit of power and performance. My will leads to a pursuit of power and performance rather than God's will, which leads to humility and acceptance. If I work hard enough, then God will love me. No, you're accepted. Stop. Rest in what I've done. Rest. And that is, that is our fight of faith, is believing in who God says that we are, not against something. If you could spend your time believing in your salvation, in your freedom, believing how free you really are, there is where the fight is. So, so the idea of God's will, it leads you to humility and acceptance. This last part, number three, and I'm going to be ending here, and it's kind of a quick, quick sermon here, but... This is the hardest part, and I pray that the Holy Spirit kind of prepare your heart for this, because it's, it's one of those things you kind of go, wow, man, Lord, that's, that's okay. So here we go. The Church of the Gray on point number three, um, there's something that happens in our life that um, we, we, we think, you know, living for him, and, and, and as you walk with him, things that were obviously out of whack in your life are being addressed, uh, perceptions of love. Perceptions of hate, people that have hurt you, things like that. They begin to be addressed. You find healing, healing in your heart. You're, you're, not, re, you're not being bound up by words that people laid on you back in the day. And, and, you're, and, and G, you're caught up with, with more of what God says about you, and it brings healing to your body and things like that. But there's a funny thing that happens when a person who's following God misunderstands what sin is. See, sin is not a benevolent king. Sin is a ruthless oppressor. And so when we get to know Jesus, we get to know him in a real strong way, then all of a sudden things in our life become addressed. So, so if you were like, if you were a major liar, I mean, everything about you, you are a liar, liar, pants on fire guy. And then you accept Jesus, right? And this is what happens. So you go, well, I accept Jesus. And you say, man, I used to be a real liar. Now I just take tell white lies. And it's better that way because it's just kind of... <laughs> No, it, it isn't like sin light. <laughs> it's like, it's like and I used to be into heavy porn. Now I'm into light porn. And I feel better about that because God knows. No, no. See, and there's something in our mind that we, we begin to equate the value of sin and what's okay. And then we misunderstand who really your oppressor is. There's nothing greater than the enemy would, enjoys 
is having a born-again, spirit-filled, empowered child of God wrapped up with not knowing who the bad guy is. Who really is the bad guy? And so this is this. Let me just. This is a story in Exodus five. Exodus five. Uh, uh, Moses goes before Pharaoh. Now Moses got it laid down who he is, what God is in him. He's got the snake thing and the, the staff. The whole. He's ready to go. He goes before the Pharaoh, and actually, as you read the story, you get the impression that Moses was like sold out. When I tell him to let my people go, he's going to go okay. And so. He's like excited. So he stands before the Pharaoh and says, hey, Pharaoh, God says, Jehovah says, let my people go. And Pharaoh goes, I, I don't know who you're talking about. I got a bunch of gods. No one talked to me about that. I don't even know who that God is. Matter of fact, I don't know who you are, but you coming in front of my presence tells me that these children of Israel have a lot of time on their hands. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a heavier burden on them because of you, Moses. They have a quota to make. They have to make so much brick with hay and stuff. Well, they're going to make the same quota, but I'm going to remove the hay, and they got to go find the hay to make the bricks. That's because of you, Moses. I'm putting that on you, buddy, because you came before me, and you threw out this thing, and it didn't go well at all, right? Now, they have been enslaved in Egypt for over 400 years. Everyone say slavery. Do you think if you've been enslaved for 400 years, you would know you're in slavery? Yeah, I mean, sure. I mean, oh, yeah, we would know. So now uh, word gets back to the people. The people go, oh, man, how could you do this to us? Moses is terrible. And so some of the foremen went to go talk to Pharaoh. And that's where we are in verse 15, Exodus 5, 15. So the Israelite foreman went to Pharaoh and pleaded with him, please, don't treat your servants like this, they begged. I went, when I read this several years, I went, whoa, wow, this is amazing. Look what it says. These Pharaoh, they went to the Pharaoh, and they pleaded with him, please don't treat your servants like this. 400 years of slavery. Now, maybe they were being politically correct. Politically correct. Maybe they're trying to be, you know, I don't know, honoring. They're telling the oppressor of their lives, they're calling him a king, and they're calling themselves servants. They don't realize they're in slavery to this oppressor. And that's the worst place for any believer to be, thinking that you're a servant to this little thing when really you're a slave. And what are these things? Let me show you what it's what Jesus said or what John said in 1 John 2.16. Uh, 2, for the world offers only a craving of physical pleasure, craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from the world. So somewhere in your mind, you're complete in Christ, but there's still something not, not working. You believe the craving for physical pleasure, God doesn't know, and therefore you got to go step out and do your own thing. Or craving for everything we see, you're, you're coveting everything you want, or uh, pride and achievement of possessions. Now, here's what I want you to realize. God wants you to be complete, lacking nothing. Matter of fact, there's a great story in Jeremiah 13. talks about this sash, this beautiful little sash that goes around the waist of a man. And God says, take this beautiful sash that goes around the waist of a man, golden, as beautiful as it is, an ornament uh, that, that, that is beautiful on a man, take it and bury it in, by the Euphrates River. So he does. Three days later, he says, go back and get it up. So he goes back and digs up the, the, the sash, and he, he, God asks him, now, what do you see? I said, well, I, I see a piece of material that's not worth anything. It's just it's trash. He said, this is what I always wanted for my children to be an, initially a, an ornate, beautiful adaptation or uh, that I would, an accessory of, that would magnify the beauty of what I think of them. Beautiful and honor and glory and power and name. This is what I've always designed. And he says, it was always in my heart for Judah and, Ju and Jerusalem to be for a name, for a praise and for a glory. But because of their pride, it's as worthless as this. It, it's always within the heartbeat of God and always will be for you to enjoy your stuff and enjoy wealth, enjoy, enjoy it all. I mean, he really doesn't care if what you drive or what you don't drive. I mean, as long as these things aren't your cravings, they're, not, they're just an expression of your blessings. What do you think, church? 
that he, he's not holding stuff back to keep you humble. You walk in humility, and you can enjoy all things. You walk with him first, and you can enjoy whatever you want. It doesn't, it's not like that. He's not withholding stuff for him from you. But the pride that we can find in things of the world can wind up distorting our pursuit of God. And we wind up not realizing who really is our oppressor and who really is our king and if we're slaves or servants. Are you all with me? To be able to stand before a king, the pharaoh, who is the primary oppressor of your life for 400 years and say, don't be so hard on your servants is a distortion of truth. So here's my, my third point. Living in the gray romanticizes about your oppressor. You think he's a benevolent king and you're his servant. The truth is he's a ruthless oppressor and you're his slave. See, he's not playing around with sin. He's for keeps. He's playing for keeps. And like I said before, you could have been out of control one place and you gotten better. <laughs> But better doesn't make any sense if you don't know you're free. You're actually free. And when you grasp you're free, then everything changes. I'm not struggling with, I'm settled in my freedom. And my life lives out something different. Isn't that good? Okay, this is, now I'm closing. Everybody, I'm closed. So chill out. You're going to make the restaurant just fine. I call this Oreo living. Oreo cookie living. You always, talk, you always hear me talk about bag of Oreos, right? I remember, you, have, you know, if you're here very long, you always hear me talk about what's your bag of Oreos. It comes from a situation that I, I had with my roommates back in college. We, we lived together in this, like, two-bedroom thing, and, and, uh, and, and we would stay up late at night at the coffee shop talking about just God and stuff. And so one night we were out a couple, you know, we were out late, and this kid kept, you know, we saw him walking by, and he slept on the, out in the parking lot. And, and uh, we kept asking, hey, what's the deal with this kid? And, and well, he was homeless, and his parents threw him out. So all the guys, we, we about two or three of us, we said, hey, listen, we, we, you know, we want you to come to our house. We're going to take you in, buddy. We don't want you out here. It's not good for you. Why don't you come to our house, and uh, we'll give you a roof over your head, and we'll, we'll, we'll help you with life. And so my roommates and I, we, we took him in. And, and so he had a lot of learning to do, like get up in the morning. Like that was the number one thing. You, know, you have to get up in the morning. And morning is not 12. Morning is like 8 o'clock, 7.30. I mean, come on, get up. And so we were working with him on disciplines of life and things like that, and he would miss some things, and my roommates would go, hey, buddy, I mean, Orlando, this, this kid's not getting it. I said, no, 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 it's going to be fine. We'll just keep, keep pressing on. We, we can do this. We can, we can help this brother. And this went on for a couple of days, and, and it was my, my custom to buy a, a bag of Oreos, take it into my refrigerator, put it in the refrigerator next to the milk, and then I would work at a restaurant, and yes, it was a Mexican restaurant, okay. And so, <laughs> and then after a full day of working at the Mexican restaurant, come home, open up a cold bag of Oreos, take a couple out with a cold glass of milk, whoo, baby. <laughs> right, that's like, ha, 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 and I'm looking forward to it. So we were going to this kid for a couple of days, about a week or two, and, and all of a sudden I get home, and the guys have been telling me, man, we got to get rid of this kid, it's not working out. And I said, no, no, no. I get home, open the refrigerator door, my Oreos are gone. And the milk is halfway gone too. And I said, that's it, he's out. <laughs> Messing with my bag of Oreos, you're out, buddy. And he said, well, to be honest with you, I'm having a hard time here because you guys expect more than my parents. It's been rough. <laughs> I said, yeah, living right does take some, some stuff, some investment. So here, here's the whole bag of Oreos thing. There's a scripture in, in 1 Samuel 17. Um, yeah, 1 Samuel 17. David's fighting Goliath, and it's all good. And we know he took him out. But I, I, 49 and 50, we can settle for 49 and 50 life. All right? So let me show you what 49 and 50 looks like. 49, reaching into a shepherd's bag, taking out a stone. He hurled it with his sling, and it hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank in, the Goliath stumbled, and he fell face down on the ground. All right? So now you have to put it in perspective. You have two hillsides. There's a valley. The armies of the enemy over here, armies of Israel, and they're looking down maybe 300 yards or 100 yards away. I mean, you don't have binoculars. You don't know what's going on. You see this kid rushing, running towards the guy. 
he makes a little movement, something happens, and you can't really determine. And all of a sudden, you see this big giant kind of stumble and fall, and everyone, well, everyone's going, what, what happened? They're several hundred you know, yards away, and the enemy is going, hey, get up. How could you stumble and fall? And Israel's going, whoa, what happened? He stumbled and fell. And so we don't know what's going on, but we know that something happened. And in your salvation, something happened with your enemy. You're not really sure, but you know something happened. And then the next verse, this is our next, our next settled kind of a Christianity. So David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone, for he had no sword. And we go, <laughs> we triumphed. And, and here's the thing. God is so precise. So let's think about this for a minute. If we stop there and go, don't go to the next verse, then what have we seen? We've seen a giant stumble and fall, and David did something. What would be the narrative? That word's been used a lot lately. What would be the narrative on this side? Well, David didn't really kill him. We don't know what happened. It looked like he stumbled, he fell, and hit his head on a rock, and he died. No glory to God, no glory to David. This is the whole, we don't know what really happened, he kind of, but we know that he, no, Israel didn't kill him. We know that David didn't kill him. And these guys are over here going, well, we know that little punk guy, kid, he, he couldn't. He just got, there's no way he could have taken him out. It had to be he stumbled, and he fell, and he hit a rock. And, and, and well, David couldn't have done that. It's impossible. So the whole story could have been changed, and no glory to God, and no man of God to rise up and lead Israel. And here's where we, we settle for that. We settle for the information. We settle for knowledge. But there's an action required against the thing that has been dogging you all your life. And in all of our lives, there's a glory to glory walk. And in all of our lives, there are things that you set down and put aside every weight and sin that so easily besets you by keeping your eyes on Jesus. And all of us in our lives, there's always a closet in our heart that God's saying, okay, now that we've gone so far, let's handle this. Can we deal with this today? Or am I the only one that God works that way with? No, we all walk this walk of being set apart, of being used by him, and he's always stirring in our heart for the goodness of God. Here's where we win the victory in verse 51. Then David ran over, pulled Goliath's sword from its sheath. David used it to kill him and cut off his head. When the Philistines saw their champion was dead, how did they determine their champion was dead? Well, when you cut someone's head off, that's pretty much, you know. <laughs> that their chapter was dead, they turned and ran. Now, here's the thing. David was 13, 14, somewhere on there, goes over there and gets this guy's sword. He's probably dragging it on, you know, over. Now, to chop off a giant's head may take a couple of whacks. <laughs> so the narrative is, he just, hey, the, they're looking down. Hey, he just fell. Yeah, yeah, I think we, we he fell and uh, I think he hit his head. Then David goes over there, and the first whack was like, bangity, blood. We think he's doing something. We're not sure. <laughs> Maybe another whack. I mean, this is a big guy, right? And he's a young kid, right? After, Maybe after a couple of whacks. Ugly, messy, blood flying everywhere. I mean, come on, stay with me now. And then he reached down and grabbed the guy's hair, and lifted up the head and said, there's no doubt, this thing is dead to me. Yeah, Come on, church. You have the information in verse 49 and 50. You have the ability to stand because you have victory. But there comes an act in all of our life to say, today's the day. We cut the head off of this one. We're done. That's where we are, church. So to conclude, bag of Oreos, right? This is how we were before Jesus. Now, before Jesus, we were ordering Oreos by the, 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 the box. That's Oreos, see? This is us. This is us completely caught up with our Oreos. Just whatever. I'm just going for it, right? Then we get saved, and we go, 
well, that was a terrible life. I know that's not good, but, you know, I'll just do double stuff. i just do one box. <laughs> hey, hey, give me some, I used to be this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I'm just doing double stuff, and it's, I know it's a family side, but it's just, you know, just. <laughs> then God says, no, it's time to let that go too. Oh, okay. And then we say, well, I got the victory over Oreos. I got the victory over my bag of Oreos. Thank you, Lord. But every once in a while. (laughs) And, you know, it's not really that big a deal. I mean, I mean, I mean, it's just a little, a little walk on the wilds. I mean, come on. I mean, so teeny. And you don't realize your oppressor is not a benevolent king. He's a ruthless oppressor. And it's time. Thank God you're not here. Thank God you got not there. And you don't have to be here either. You're free. And how do we get there? God has given you the ability to proclaim. God has given you, church, children of God, the ability to proclaim and create the reality of your life. And you may not feel it, and you may not even sense it, but you begin to say, I'm free. I'm free from that oppression of my life. Thank you, God. It's been a long trek. It's time to deal with it, and I'm free. And you proclaim it. And the minute you proclaim it, the Spirit of God says, I'll back that up. And that's why we walk by the Spirit, church. And we proclaim even what we do not see We proclaim the heartbeat of God. The heartbeat of God is telling you it's time to be free from that. And as you proclaim, you're actually proclaiming the very nature of God within you. What do you think, church? It's a good day. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. He's so good. You're so good, Lord. Let's pray. Father, we come before you in Jesus' name. I thank you for this word been given by the Spirit and received by the Spirit, God, and I pray right now that we as a body will not settle for process, but God, that we would continue for presence. I thank you, Holy One, that you guide our every step, our every word by your Spirit. And thank God we're not what we used to be, but we're so far, Lord God, removed from that. So thankful. Help us to understand just how free we really are. And help us to start speaking the language of freedom. You're a good God and you care for us. And you love us so. And I thank you, Lord God, by the Spirit that your people are receiving this word to their hearts. Now, there may be somebody who never received Jesus as Lord of their life. I'd like to repeat after me, receiving Jesus as Lord. If you repeat after me, Father, I call you my Father. I thank you for Jesus. I receive him as Lord of my life. My sins are forgiven. My past is forgotten. I stand completely clean and free. My future is full of hope. I have strength for today and life for tomorrow. I belong to you, God, and you belong to me. In Jesus' name, amen.